What's the 411 on Blades in Paradise? Society collapsed, but our corporate overlords rebuilt it. In this steampunk dystopia played in Jim Harper's Blades in the Dark, you'll join the Express Service Parcel Network, or ESPN, as they seek to find out if paradise is really heaven on earth, or if there's something darker under the surface. Our first episode drops 4-11-24, but you can subscribe now wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Dice Company is a sweary, brutal, violent podcast which deals with adult themes. No feelings were hurt in the making of it, but listener discretion is advised. Dice Company will always be free, but it's not free to make. Please consider supporting us on Patreon or Apple Podcasts and get access to our weekly roundtable show, Extra Roll. Just follow any of the links in the show notes for this chapter. Welcome on and all to Dice Company, where a group of old friends weave tales of triumph, heroism, and despair under the guise of playing Dungeons and Dragons. My name is Tom, and I'll be your DM through the continuing adventures of the Order of the Heron. Order of the Heron, please introduce yourselves and your characters. Hi, I'm Alex, and I'm playing Augustusino. Hi, my name is Charlie, and I play Vanda Finnick. Hello, my name is Dave, and I play Benny Quez, a newly haircutted rogue. Vandy has a magical eye. <laughs> <laughs> You're always riffing off other people's facts. <laughs> <laughs> I would say this is my fact, but bookending yours. <laughs> Hi, I'm Harry, and I play Tok, a, an imposing six foot eight automaton and master craftsman. Vanda crafts stuff too. He helped you. <laughs> he crafts lies. <laughs> <Yep>. Guilty as charged. <laughs> <laughs> and before we begin, let's delve into the mailbag. We start with two questions one from Axel Runholm. And one from Shelby Cat, maker of exceptional dice. How has it been doing D&D as a podcast rather than a home game? Is it better or worse? And how has the podcast changed your lives? And has it changed your perspective of the TTRPG community in any way? It is a bit different to, uh, to playing on your own. Uh, I, was, I was saying when we all got together that... You played D&D on your own? Yes. On my own. No, I, when... <laughs> it's a bit different. Yeah. It's different to playing playing on our own without people listening. But whilst we're, whilst we're playing, I'm really not thinking about the fact that there are loads of people listening to us. Yeah, that would be awful. I think I've probably now played more D&D as a podcast than I have in person, I think. So this feels pretty normal, to be honest. Do you think it would be weird if you went to then play a home game, having now done the recording so much? I think, you know, it's like a really strange comment. I think I'd use my hands more. <laughs> I tend to, I tend to sit quite still when I'm naturally flamboyant. So I think I've learned not to, maybe I, maybe that would turn that would happen in my game and people would be why is that guy sitting so still? It's weird. Great player, great guy. All arms though, all arms and hands. <laughs> um and how has it changed your perspective of the TTRPG community or has it? Yeah, I don't. I don't know if it's really changed. I suppose like I already had some idea of people who played D anD D before, but it seems to me it's it seems a very welcoming and diverse place, and they're very supportive. And yeah, they they just seem like a really lovely bunch of people. On the whole, obviously you get people who are not so great in all walks of life, but they're limited. I would say in the TTRPG community, they're also a bunch of people who really really like showing uh, photographs of their shelves. Well, who doesn't? My shelf has grown already. I've just added the Fallout TTRPG to my collection. Ooh, good man. By two things that seem to be really, well, to me, obvious about the people that talk to us online. One is they all know so much more about D&D than I do. They always have a really good grasp of the mechanics. And I don't know how I feel about that. I guess intimidated. Who knows? But And the other thing is I feel like it's very creative when there's loads of really, when we do something online. There's usually an astonishingly creative response to it. And that's awesome. I think that might be one of my favorite parts about all of this is when someone takes a throwaway line, say, in what we do, and then turns it into something so much better. <laughs> and that's just really awesome to see. So yeah, that's my things. I feel like we've been um we've been side at less than I might have anticipated. I think obviously Tom and Harry are TTRPG veterans. 
I understand a lot about the rules and systems, but the other three of us, to a greater or lesser extent, um, are more novice But we've really not had a lot of people kind of going, oh, I can't believe you did that. Or, you know what I mean? People have helped us out when we've got questions or have, you know, kind of occasionally asked if we're doing a homebrew rule or if we're, you know, playing a strict D&D 5e rules. But it's always out of curiosity or helpfulness that we've had it. We've not had people going, oh, I can't believe you did that, which I think was a bit of a, a bit of a fear. And you kind of put something out there that you're going to have people upset at the way you're doing the hobby that means a lot to them. So it's been quite nice not to have that. It's also shaken my foundation of what of my own sense of what's good and bad. I, I invariably say... <laughs> Do you mean I listen... playing band or...? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've become morally ambiguous. No, it's when we do something I, that I would regard as great in the podcast and it doesn't seem to get any real feedback. And then we do something I personally don't find as good as, say, another part in the episode. And that's the only thing that gets talked about. And, I mean, clearly the majority is right. So... I have. I, I'm just shaking. My sense of what's right and wrong is shaken by that. You're not alone in that. I I suffer from that a great deal as well. Things that I think are because obviously it's all comes down to personal taste, doesn't it? But my personal taste appears to be really off the pulse. Yeah, fortunately, I'm always right. The people <laughs> the people want more hex crawls and more uh, more crunchy rules. I just want. After a near lifetime of research, I can say with authority that that isn't true. <laughs> Harry is rarely right, <laughs> and if he is right. Start looking around you and rolling for investigation because something is horribly wrong somewhere else. I don't know if you guys would would know this, but there's been like a for a long time a tradition in in RPGs of um, of like teaching new people and being nice about it because for an awfully long time there weren't that many people who played and um, it wasn't something you would like just like most friends and family you knew didn't play or wouldn't understand the game anyway, and so sort of like bringing new people into the hobby was an important thing to do if you wanted to play at all and so being nice was yeah do you mean like in school you could have been crushed if you took this to the wrong group and they'd be like no this is nerdy and unacceptable sort of thing could and would and they could and did charlie <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well i've got a parallel for that because i always listened to things growing up and very much into stories that you'd listen to and that was deeply uncool until Many, many years later, you have things like Audible and obviously podcasts, and everyone's cool with it now. But I remember there being a time when no one was cool with it. And it was like a, a hobby I kept to myself because it was just not something you could say in, you know, in school and say, oh, my God, I've had this great audio book. And they'd be like, that's a weakness. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the things that we um, like uh, uh, chatted about quite early on was the fact that like we both listened to quite a lot of audio books how did we admit that to each other we both just horribly <laughs> drunk like did we is there like horribly. some jesuit meeting <laughs> where we <laughs> went underground doffed our robes and said we both listened to audio books no you know i actually do know what it was it was um listening to music and i'd put things on random and it just randomly started reading one of the Discworld um audio books i don't i don't remember that but I'm assuming you looked at me with near, hop, yes, near board like horror. I'd be like, so that's who you really are. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and now we live in a world where Dame Judy Dench plays D&D with her grandchildren. Exactly. Uh, Dame Judy, if you're listening, please come on the podcast. We'd love to have you. I mean, that'd be amazing. Our second question comes from Drowl Cardblim, who asks, I've noticed a stark contrast between how some... Most of the other players view Vander's scorched earth policy of annihilation when it comes to worshippers of evil attempting to murder their PCs. Does this perspective stem from a certain view of morality or honour, perhaps a regional perspective, or maybe a D&D heroic expectation? Can I just start there by saying that I think Drow's on my side with that. I think he was very diplomatic, but that's definitely Team Vander talk. It certainly sounds like it to me, yeah, for sure. Well, he was uh he, he was he would have been right about Tiara, wouldn't he? I'm glad you raised that. Yeah. <laughs> well, I I very nearly uh yeah. Very nearly what? Change sides. <laughs> Toxies no sides. The thing about scorched earth is it doesn't hit back. Well, I think uh I think Tear seems to be on our side anyway. He seems like quite a scorched earth kind of guy, doesn't he? Yes, he does. I think it's more from uh, a sense of needing a bit of balance. It's the god of self-sacrifice and human sacrifice. I get my balance from soup. See, you just need a bit of counterweight to Vanda. Otherwise, <laughs> who knows where we'd end up? I think you need a literal angel to balance out Vanda. 
have fewer enemies. <laughs> Lenny the dog may, may be a literal angel. Who knows? The literal devil. DM gave nothing away. I was watching his facial reactions for that one. Nice. And so we beat on boats against the current, borne back ceaselessly into the past in the next chapter of Dice Company. Previously on Dice Company, you all enjoyed a party with the people of Sanctuary, learning a great deal about what's been happening, and in some cases, hearing some tragic news. Despite the joyous celebrations, it was tinged with melancholy, and you all awaken the following day feeling a little tired, and with two weeks to wait until the Sterling returns. What would you like to do? Uh, well, Tok has got various projects that he would like to complete. The first of which he will approach Vanda about... Vanda. I wish for your assistance. I have a project. It requires knowledge of minds. Well, then you've come to just the right place, Talk. Incorrect. The correct place is my workshop. Ah, yes. And Vanda rolls an eye you can't see. <laughs> <laughs> then lead on, Talk. Back at Talk's workshop, Vanda will see um, the two automatons uh, set up in harnesses, one of which is as tipped over so that its cranial plate is resting against a, a work table. Next to it is a very clean, fluffy pillow that you may recognize from uh, Papa Ungamas, connected by strange, I would say cables, but they kind of look a little bit like they're possibly alive, like vines, to a, uh, a I want to say a hat, but it's not quite that well built. Tok will offer the chair to Vanda and indicate that he's to put the hat on. Student shows a good knowledge of torturing fundamentals, but the pillow is a curious touch. I would have to give you a B plus, Tok. Vanda, I do not follow. I am not attempting torture. I am attempting the inception of the mind of this automaton. It requires memories to be inserted. Is this within your capabilities? Am I to understand that you wish my memories to be inserted into an automaton? Negative. The memories are contained in this memorandum crystal. And Tuck will lift one up and it will be placed into a small receptacle by the automaton's head. The memories are my own. Fascinating. Then what, pray, does my mind have to do with this experiment? The pillow will put the automaton into a dreamlike state. This state is one that I am unable to intrude upon. I believe it is one that you are able to intrude upon. I can modify memories in a memorandum crystal, but I may not make changes to the Tavistock matrix that surrounds it. I must confess, Tok, that I never imagined to be invited to the dreams of another I always felt myself to be more akin to nightmares, but certainly I can assist you. And Vander sits down and places the skull cap on his head. Okay, Tok will make various uh, adjustments uh, and uh, I would say flick levers, but more attach cables to, uh, to stuff. The pillow goes under the, uh, the automaton's head. The automaton is, I want to say, switched on. He'll, he'll attach the Leafite crystal into the correct place. And uh, presumably Vander will be able to enter its mind. I believe I take your meaning. And Vanda casts Mind Spike. Vanda, as has happened previously before, you enter the mind of the automaton that you found in the, that Tok found in the Topaz Keep. Your mental projection slowly floats down and lands on an, what appears to be an endlessly sandy desert. As you turn in the distance, you see the Citadel from Roanoke. There appear to be marching automatons heading directly towards it. There are explosions and screams, and then silence as it all disappears into sand before you. There is one automaton remaining who approaches you. Hello. Unsettling, Vander says to himself. Well met, automaton. The citadel has fallen. So I see. What then is your purpose now? The automaton 
cocks his head to the side in a fashion that you've seen Tok do many times. I do not know. That is well, for I have come with a purpose for you. What is my purpose? Vander approaches the automaton. I have a gift. What is this gift? Vander reaches his hand into his own robes in the hopes that in this plane he can locate the crystal that he needs to bestow on the automaton. What is that? It is your path back to a plane where you can be most useful. I find this to be acceptable and it opens its faceplate. Vander reaches forward and places the crystal into the slot of the automaton's brain. The moment he does that, there is a bright flash of light and the sandy desert gets blown away, leaving just plain white everywhere. Only Vander and the automaton remain. A second later, Vander, you are back in control of your body. Vander, was the operation successful? I believe it was, Tok. Vander rises slightly wobbly from his experience in an automaton's mind, which is new even to Vanda. Presumably, you ask me to enter a second endless desert. Endless desert? Ah, yes, semantics. Forget I spoke. Forgive me, Tok. Vanda rises. I have some errands to run. I'll be some time. And as he says so, Vanda makes his way out of Tok's hut and walks out of Sanctuary into the woods. So I am actually looking for the stagecoach. Whereabouts is that? And that is to the south of Sanctuary, where you left it. Excellent. Vanda shambles quietly out of the Sanctuary, making his way to the stagecoach. With some difficulty, and over several minutes, he clambers into the driver's position, unleashes the handbrake, and G's the horses up. Where, where is it you're heading to? I am making my way to Rutal. Ah, to see an old friend? I may be doing that, yes. <laughs> well, I'm going to say that you have enough experience riding the stagecoach now that you don't need to do an animal handling check, so you simply depart. Excellent. I'm, I'm going to hope that Vanda doesn't get attacked en route here, because he's probably the most terrifying thing in the woods. Give me a d20 roll, please. Okay. A three. Benny, uh, you wake up a bit groggy-headed. What would you like to do? So I'm back in my, my old room, aren't I? Modelled like the ship. I guess I'll um, get up, see if I can work out where one might find some breakfast around here. You head out of your quarters, and you can see across from the lake is the area where the party took place last night, and there is a l large table that's been set up with lots of breakfast foods on it, and a lot of the villagers are already around it, eating and sharing food and passing it around. You see over there, Boffo, a couple of the faces that you've seen before, uh, and Serafina seems to be walking around and just chatting to random people. And he heads over to the big table area, says a few hellos, to villagers that he recognises. Takes a seat opposite Boffo. Morning, Betty. Hi, morning. How are you feeling? I feel like an owl bear's stamped on me. I know that feeling very well. Yeah, have some bacon. He slides a plate of bacon across to you. You're a gent, thank you. What happened to you at the end last night? Oh, I stayed up with that Alara. She's actually quite good fun, you know. Yeah, no, I, I like Alara. I think she's done a fine job as leader here as well. Yeah, she mentioned that she was the leader and she helped get the people along with you guys to safety. It was, uh, it was quite the thrilling story. Do you reckon she's all right with not being leader anymore? Yeah, she said it was actually quite a relief. I can see that, actually. Yeah, yeah. Oh, good. As long as that's not going to cause any friction. Nope, no friction as far as I can tell. But I have to thank you for uh, convincing me to stay. This food is delicious and... Yeah, I'm, I might postpone my leaving for another couple of hours just so I can get my fill. Oh, you're right sentimental, you, aren't you? Sticking around for some grub. It's beautiful, Buffalo, beautiful. Oh, thank you. You know, didn't want to see your old pal Benny for a couple more hours. No, just interested in bacon. So while I was talking to that Alara last night, she mentioned Kaelin, who was the former leader. Yeah, that's right, back in... Um, Old Haven, yeah. Sorry, state of affairs, if you ask me. How do you mean? 
man stays behind to help his kin, and then he's rounded up by the Empire and shipped off to God knows where. Fingers. Fingers. Yeah. Yeah, we um, we found that out not so long ago. There's nowhere I'd rather be less than the Fingers. Yeah. It's got a reputation, hasn't it? As once people go there, they don't come out. I mean, releasing Kaelin is, you know, top of the to-do list, but, you know, you can't just go to the Fingers, can you? No, you cannot. I've heard a few stories about them, but it's not like having a... Not, it's not the same as having a blueprints and a understanding of guard rotation, is it? Hearing legends from people wandering through about the horrors. Take a braver man than me to break in there if you're trying to get someone out. I mean, I could ask around. Would you? Aye, well, I'm planning to go to Slatom. I feel like that's a good place to start. What is it specifically you'd be after? I don't know, really. Anything that would give us a bit of an head start. So, plans for layout. I mean, it's optimistic, but anything you could find out about guard movements or even like what guards are wearing up there what their outfits look like so we could replicate them or anything like that you'll find out what ids look like up there if they've got papers that everyone's got or anything like that yeah that's the, that's the kind of stuff i'd imagine if you were able to get this kill and out of there it would be quite embarrassing for the emperor and the empire as a whole wouldn't be great would it and you see a smile on his face no it would not I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm also going to get him out because it's Kaelin and he's he's a really he's a really fine person. I think you'd like him if you met him. But also, you know, as a bonus, it would look absolutely terrible, wouldn't it? <laughs> ah, yes, it would. All right, I'll put some feelers out. See if I can find out anything. All right, but be careful while you're doing it, eh? You know me. Always careful. I suppose you are alive, so you must be doing something right. Indeed. So, what you've got planned for the next few days? I'm just gonna wait around here, get fat on this delicious food. Well, I'll give it a go. Um, I got to got to do a bit of work with with Seraphina. If you, um, yeah, since we last met, I've um, what's the best way to put it? I've developed unworldly powers, Buffo. That's what I've, that's what's happened. Unworldly powers, but um, you know, it's got pros and cons. Oh, yes, of course. Uh, the mighty Benji. A great wizard, are you? <laughs> Benny gives him a look. Filthy look. And then goes, Missy! And the raven swoops down and nicks Boffo's last sausage straight off his plate. Oh, by the gods! What? You're telling me you could control animals now? Well, not plural, but an, an animal. That's Missy. She's got my sausage! Yeah, I know. I see. And this Seraphina... She can, what, help you out a bit more? I think so. Just need to need to be able to control it, you know? It's useful, but, I mean, you've seen how old I look. No. That's, that, that's not natural. That's not normal. That's, that's something that's happened because I can't control it. No, I could see why that would be a concern. Unbelievable. So Benny Quez is a wizard in training. A uh, wizard, no. Wizard's not the right word, is it? I don't know what it is. An arcane user. Yeah, go on. Yeah, that'll do. <laughs> I like that. Arcane user. So you've got these new powers. You're getting training from someone with what looks like an awful lot of power. I suppose I am. Yeah. And you're not sure whether to fight back against the Empire? Well, I mean, when you put it like that, it sounds bad, doesn't it? It's a waste. If I could control birds to seal sausages, and presumably much more, I wouldn't be hiding away. If you're given the opportunity to train with this this powerful Seraphina, and I've I've heard some whispers about how powerful she is, apparently this entire place was created by her, that to me is not something you want to pass up. Yeah, and Benny takes a moment and starts to look a bit serious. And he says, uh, yeah, I know you're right, really, but it's a lot, isn't it? Aye. That it is. I don't envy you at all, but it's easy for me to sit here and tell you what you should be doing. And I suppose people have been telling us what we should be doing since we were kids. So I won't tell you what you should do, but it is something you should at least consider. If not for me or yourself, then do it for the old gang and do it because it's right. Yeah, yeah, I'll, um, I'll think on it. I mean... I say I'll think on it. 
I know you're right. I'll um, find some way to summon up courage to do it. That's what I mean. It's in there. I know it. But, but Botho, just... You know you said you, you didn't envy me at all. You do envy me my raven that can steal breakfast food, don't you? Of course I do. A raven that can steal <laughs> breakfast. My <laughs> God. <laughs> I'd never go hungry again. Have you got any other animals up your sleeve, or is it just the raven? You've met me dog, right? No. You can summon a dog? Have you not met Lenny? No, I can't summon a dog. I've just got a dog. What does he do? Steal dinner? No. He, um... I thought he were a normal dog, but we're starting to think maybe he's not just a normal dog. Hang on, I'll go and find him. And Benny pops up from the bench and goes back to his room to, to grab Lenny the dog, brings him back to introduce him to Buffo. He's basically just a really good boy, but he might also be some sort of magic dog, demon, angel, don't know. It's, a, it's an open question at this stage, but he's a really good dog. He's really, oh, look at his little face. Well, it's no demon, is he? Look at him. Oh, he's absolutely adorable. I think you've had too much creme de month. It's just a dog. But what a dog. I know. Yeah, that's what I tell myself. Buffo scratches him, and the two of you continue to enjoy breakfast. Having eaten breakfast, Benny, you get up from the table with Lenny and you say your fond farewells to Buffo. As you're heading over to Serafina's hut to see her about your training, you're interrupted by a man dressed in magnificently garish yellow and blue plumed shirt and breeches. He has messy bright red hair and is carrying a quill and parchment. Um, excuse me, is it, um, it's Benny, isn't it? Uh, it, it is, yep. Yeah. Um... Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. Uh, my name is Kale Finn Vala, and I am writing the history of Alestia. Uh, I spoke to two of your colleagues, uh, the, the two leaders of the Order of the Heron, uh, Augustus Zeno and Van der Finnick. Oh, is that what they are, is it? The two leaders of the Order of the Heron? That's right. But they did mention, they mentioned yourself uh, and the automaton Tok. Oh, yeah. And Tick, and um, I, I said that I would come and speak to you about it. And I have a question, or a few questions, if you don't mind. What's um, what's my role in the Order of the Heron, if you don't mind me asking? Well, they said you played a key role in supporting them. Key role as a helper. Mm. Oh, that sounds fun. So, yeah, with, with that in mind, um, could you explain the, the feeling of adventuring with the likes of Vanda and Augustus? Like, what? how does that feel? I think it's really a bit too overwhelming to describe, to be honest. You see him start to scribble on his parchment. I see, I see. I mean, it must be thrilling. The nature of things that are a bit too overwhelming to describe is that you can't describe them. I see, and you see him start to describe them in very thrilling and verbose terms. What would you say you've learnt from them? To be honest, pal, I feel like I'm not going to really be able to contribute to your book. I think you've I think you've got what you need on the order of the heron, to be honest. So if it's all the same with you, I'll 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 just, you know, let the the wonderful words of Augustus and uh, and Vander speak for me. It's what it's what they'd want anyway. I completely understand, of course. Uh, just just one last thing and then I'll let you go. Um can I have your surname? Uh, they didn't mention your surname. Oh didn't they? Oh. Uh they give you their names. Yes. Did they really? That's interesting. What are you planning on doing with this? Uh... I'm, I'm writing the complete history of the Order of the Heron as part of the ongoing series, The Complete History of Alestia. I see. And is this, this going to be published and, and circulated at any time in the near future? It won't be the near future. I mean, obviously, publish, like publishing a whole collection of books that chart the entire history of a continent and world is going to take me a few years at least before I publish this. And many ponders and tries to calculate the pros and cons of telling this man his real name. And in the end, he can't work it out. And he says, it's Quez. My surname's Quez. Quez. Well, thank you very much, Benny Quez. Uh, you're welcome. What else would you like to do? 
Okay, almost immediately, uh, Toc would like to um, get his workshop uh, reset up for some magic item crafting. He has several ideas. Toc would like to make a, uh, a plus one magical shield from the mithril ore, uh, which will take three pounds of mithril ore. Toc lights up the forge. Uh, he gets his new automatons to help with the bellows um, and with the, uh, the purification chamber that involves lots of glass tubes and chemicals releasing uh, uh, strange gases into the metal. It heats up white hot and when it is poured out to be hammered into shape, it doesn't react like steel wood, it almost floats across the surface of the um, the steel chamber. Tok and the automatons work it with hammers. Um, early in the process, while you're refining the mithril in order to use it to create your new magical item, there is a knock at your door. Uh, Tok will continue his work and merely say, Enter. The door opens and in walks Boffo. Hello, Tok. Greetings, human. Designation, Boffo. You are friends with Benny, correct? I'm friends with him, I. I'm not a human, though. I'm a gnome. Greetings, gnome. I'm about to leave, and I've been talking to Benji, and he speaks very highly of you. So I thought, rather than letting him look like shit going forward, I would gift you these. And he reaches into his satchel and pulls out the slightly rusted shears. He'll trust you to cut his hair and give him a shave every once in a while. These shears are special to Benny, are they not? That they are. I'm the only one he trusts, except maybe for you. Boffo the Gnome, you have my thanks. It is an honor to have trust. Aye, it is an honor. Do me a favor, keep him out of trouble, and make sure that he doesn't just sit down and do nothing. I will defend him when he is in danger. I am unsure as to whether he will accept scheduling assistance. Keeping him safe will be fine. Anyway, it's time for me to leave. It was a, uh, it was unusual meeting you. I'd say it was actually quite nice. I can see why I like you. Goodbye, Boffo. It was a pleasure to meet you. And Boffo turns and leaves, allowing you to continue with your work. So after after Toc has finished uh, constructing the shield, uh, he's going to move with the automaton straight into uh, constructing a sending stone with the tourmaline gems that he has from uh, Verakir. That will, with two assistants, uh, seeing as they have his crafting skills, thanks to Vanda, um, that will also take 0.6 weeks and cost 200 gold, taking Tok down to a paltry 250 gold, um, which means his next projects will have to be put on hold slightly whilst he saves up. Okay, very nice, very nice. I look forward to seeing what he makes next. Well... Uh, that will be uh, some normal mundane half-plate armour uh, as an upgrade to his current armour, uh, which will cost him uh, 375 gold coins and take five weeks with his two automatons helping him. Benny, you make it over to Serafina's hut. The door is open and she already, you can tell that she already knows that you're there and you hear from the other side. Hey, Benny. Morning, Serafina. Come in. Please have some tea. Thanks. And she pours you delicious herbal tea. Lovely. So, Benny, you've come for the first part of your training, I presume. Yeah, I suppose I have. Okay. It should be fairly simple. Let's head out to the lake. Lead on. So she takes you down by the azure lake. With a wave of her hand, the tree canopy above retreats slightly, allowing blistering sunshine to bathe the area where you're both stood. She begins by taking you through some simple breathing exercises, as well as some expressive movement. After an hour or so of doing it, you do feel quite calmed by the whole process. That's it. It's good to be able to control oneself and one's emotions. I'd imagine most of the outbursts you've seen have been because you were scared. I've been, um, yeah, I've been wondering about that. I was scared or stressed out or, yeah, something along those lines. And I'd imagine traveling with the people that you travel with and in the situations in which you have found yourself has been quite stressful. Yeah, it's, uh, certainly had its moments. If you don't mind me asking, Vanda seems to have taken quite an interest in you. He does, yeah. How does that make you feel? I've been wondering about that myself. When Vander first realised something was going on, it suddenly became, you know, 
very attentive. And I think um, my first response was Vanda. My first response was Vanda had obviously recognised that I could be useful to him. And I was, uh, I found that quite off-putting, as you can imagine. It was suddenly right up in my face, whole time. Um, but yeah, because I could be a, a handy tool. But uh, over the weeks that have followed, you know, I think, I mean, don't get me wrong, he does definitely still think that. But um, I think he's also, you know, just trying to look out for me a bit. It seems to me that while he may be manipulative, yep. I'm sure that there are elements of him who would be able to see your usefulness. I don't think he would have mentioned you to me when we spoke if there wasn't some kind of connection between the two of you. What's he said to you? He expressed his desire for you to get trading. Well, I, I did sort of blast a fireball into him once, so that, that might have something to do with it, to be honest. I'm sure he deserved it. Yeah, I, di I mean, I didn't do it intentionally, obviously, but you know. You might not know this about the Rojan, but each person when they're trained, having undergone their reckoning, they usually develop a certain specific style of arcane power. In my case, they refer to me as the Master of Illusion, which is a gaudy title, but I can certainly bend and shape the realities of people looking on if I need to. I found the, the kind of stuff that I can do. So the thing is, before this all came to light, I had uh, I had acquired some some arcane materials from uh, from an extensive library belonging to a friend of mine. Uh, I was sort of interested in in, in becoming the best at my profession, if you like. And mm. uh, I found that the skills that or the, the the abilities that I've acquired kind of fit in along those lines. The kind of things that I were researching, you know. I guess going back to that profession, way of life, whatever you want to call it, don't feel like something that's going to happen anytime soon, but turns out some of them skills are quite handy in other contexts as well. Indeed. You talk about your future as if it is written, which it is not. You still have the power to make decisions and choices yourself. Yeah. Petty thief don't feel really on cards at the moment though, does it? I mean, even a really good petty thief. Really cool. Well, being the master of illusion, I would simply change some of the words. A master rogue sounds far more impressive. <laughs> maybe. Well, maybe even a member of the Council of Rojan. Got a lot of pickpockets on the Council of Rojan, do you? Shadowblade was known to play the odd prank from time to time. Well, Shadowblade. You could tell he's a joker just from name, couldn't you? <laughs> it's easy to look on something like the Rojan as some kind of mythical creatures beyond reproach. But we were all people before we gave ourselves the ostentatious title. Yeah, yeah, I suppose so. What were you before you became a Rojan? Well, growing up in Nebuchadnezzar, I spent most of my time as a performer on the street. I have an immaculate singing voice, and I used to sing in order to collect coppers. May I have a song now? Maybe when your training is complete. Most of the Rojan didn't come from high authority or positions of power, and so all of us did the best that we could in the time that we had available. We weren't perfect, and we made mistakes, but we always tried to do what was right. That's all you can do, isn't it? It is. Anyway, that's enough training for today. Come and see me again tomorrow, and we'll run through it another time. Ask you one question before we end. Of course. This aging, I don't know, I don't know how many years I've aged, is that, is that just gone now, them years? That is an interesting question. I suppose in answering it, a lot will depend on how your powers grow and how much training you get and how experienced you are with the use of the arcane. If you were to be trained, I'm sure we could concoct some kind of way to give you back the decade or so that you've lost. Okay, well, that's quite its appeal. Augustus, the morning after the party, you have awoken feeling a little bit worse for wear after all the drinking you did with Vanda, and you have woken up quite late. <laughs> it's now almost midday. As you stretch, get dressed, you step out of your hut and you can see across the lake from you is a table set up with the scraps of breakfast remaining. And further along the lakeside, you can see Benny moving in very calm shapes uh, with Serafina giving him advice. Augustus ignores 
Benny and his stupid dancing and heads over to the breakfast table and sort of picks around at breakfast in that sort of hungover way. You need to try a few dry, salty things and stay away from any healthy food that could cause you to relapse. Having got your fill, uh, you hear the familiar voice of Thrain as he sits down opposite you. The Augustus, good morning. Good morning, Thrain. And how are you feeling today? I've had better mornings, but I think I'm ready now for the day. Excellent. Are you up for some adventure? Always. What do you have in mind? Well, the plan is to head into Roanoke, as we talked about last night. I just wanted to make sure that you were not drunk and making bad decisions. No, no, my memory is crystal clear, says Augustus, not remembering any of that. And then, a bit more seriously, yes, I would like to go into Roanoke. When do you plan to go? And we are leaving in a few hours, and he whistles loudly, and four gnomes appear around him. These are my fellow hunters, Gilly, Cedric, Pip, and Melis. Pleasure to meet you, gentlemen. What do you hunt in Roanoke, and what can you, what have you found? Well, we're trying to find food, so hunting for any animals that provide a rich source of protein is the first step. But we also wish to chart this land as well. The maps are out of date and since the final battle things are not as they were very good yes if you'll have me along i'd be delighted to join excellent we plan to travel by car as it is quicker to get out to as far as we can over the course of a week do you enjoy traveling by stagecoach mm, stagecoach would be quicker very well well we left a stagecoach beyond the trees i don't know if we might be able to bring it round somehow to the route you plan to take into roanoke cedric go check on stagecoach if you would like to prep your supplies, we should have enough food to take us out there for a few days and back. So make sure we get set up for the travel. Very well. I should be ready. And Augustus strides off into his hut and then realises that he hasn't got anything in there to get ready with. Uh, but he can't come out now, so he just waits in the hut as if he's doing stuff. 20 minutes or so later, having just potted around in his hut doing nothing really, Augustus, you step out of your hut again and you can see Thrain and the gnomes are packing up a very basic looking cart with one horse um, as you approach them cedric the gnome says no stagecoach apparently vander took it earlier ah mr finnick well i shall have words with him later in the day Fair enough have you got a tent with you yes a very fine tent should i bring it bring it along absolutely anything that might help us for camping of an evening once we've traveled i was thinking it would be worth us going as far as we possibly can into roanoke in a rough direction of the citadel i don't imagine we'll make it all the way there but it'd be good to see what is between here and there yes i agree this is good let us head on out very well Augustus checks the hilt of his sword, habit that he is finding himself doing ever more often, and pushes away any weird concerns he has about that habit and follows the gang. Along with Thrain and the four gnomes, you leave Sanctuary and head north into Roanoke on the cart. Um, it is nothing like travelling in the style of which you have become accustomed in recent weeks. As before, once beyond the boundaries of the Sanctum, sound and noise are muted. Overhead, constantly churning clouds cover the sky of sunlight, leaving a relatively dark land, even at midday. Can I have a d20 roll, please? Four. The first day of exploration, and the going is slow. It is at least methodical, however, leading to very little in the way of discoveries. The cart traverses the plains with relative ease, and the lack of vegetation allows for easy progress. Benny, you've been training for hours with Serafina. And uh, one more question, if it's not pushing it too far. Of course. You've met me dog, haven't you? I have not had the pleasure. Could you... This is a weird question. Could you come and meet me dog? Of course, I have an affinity with animals. Good. I mean, pretty sure he's an animal. But look, I don't want to don't want to explain it too much. If you could come and have a, have a look at him and meet him and tell me what you think, I'd, I'd be grateful. Okay. Lead on. And she follows you to as you head back to your hut in order to see Lenny. So as we get back, I, I open the door and call Lenny out. Come here, Lenny. Come on. Give me a insight check. That is a 16 for insight. You notice that the moment she sees Lenny, that she raises her eyebrows, um, which is an odd reaction to seeing a dog. And she bends down and begins to stroke Lenny. My, oh my, where did you find this dog? Well, that's the funny thing. You were just on Vander's airship. Kind of figured he were a stray. Interesting. 
I mean, pretty clear from your expression that he's not just a stray. Do you know or are you guessing? I don't know how familiar you are with familiars. Mm. I mean, I got one, but beyond that, it's a bit of a mystery. Well, this is certainly a familiar. My familiar? No. I'd be surprised if you're able to summon a creature without knowing that you were summoning it. There's a ritual that takes a few minutes to perform. Yeah, I know. I've done it. But not for this dog. Well, no. i got to be honest. I didn't really know what I was getting when I performed the ritual. It turned out to be Missy the Raven. You seen me, Raven? I have seen a Raven. But I'd already got Lenny at that point, and I didn't summon him. So he's someone else's familiar. That is correct. It is more complicated than that also. And you are not going to believe it when I tell you. But one of my old friends on the council used to have a familiar that took the shape of a dog. Similar to this. It's been so long, I can't remember if it's exactly like this. This council member alive? I didn't think so. That if this was his familiar, it seems highly unlikely that he would be dead. Wow. Well, I don't really know what to say to that. No. The, the person you're talking about, is he, he, she, they? He. For, la for lack of a better word, is he a goodie? It's complicated, as always. His Rojan name was Lionheart. Okay, promising. And he was one of the bravest fighters that we had. I mean, you'd hope so. Otherwise, Lionheart's a terrible name. <laughs> As I mentioned to you before, each council member was adept at their own disciplines. And he was a great strategist and fighter, similar to Dawn Rider. But the divisions between the two of them about what we should do during the war became more vociferous, more angry, and more personal. And eventually Lionheart left the council to try and take matters into his own hands. And we assumed he had died fighting Salazar in Lunadown. So he's probably still alive. I would be amazed if he was still alive. Nothing would have stopped him from killing Salazar except death. And seeing as the Emperor still lives, it stands to reason that he is unable to fight. What's his familiar doing here? That is a very good question. Has the creature ever been killed or destroyed? Not that I know of. So, when we fled Haven in the stagecoach, I left Lenny on the Sterling with the automatons. We went underground into Verakir. And he turned up. Couldn't believe it. Thought Augustus was losing his mind. But it turned out he were there. I mean, Verakir were full of zombies. So I didn't really understand how many had survived. But I don't know. It's possible. He, I suppose he didn't. It seems highly unlikely that he'd be able to keep up with you. Seeing as I know you're on the stagecoach. And if he wasn't with you then, none of this makes sense. Yeah. In terms of having the dog around, if he is Lionheart's, well, that would be good news. And if he's not? Well... Then he's someone else's, and that brings up a whole host of other questions. What do we do? Has the dog in any way shown any aggression towards you? No, never, never. And he can sort of heal wounds. One time Vander were injured, and Lenny went up, and I think he like licked him or something, and, and you could see the, the wounds healing. A celestial familiar with the power to heal injured Rojan. That seems to me to be a boon. It does, doesn't it? It does. It's, yeah, he's... It'll be all right, won't it? We can. We should. We should. We should keep him, right? She looks at you for a moment and then smiles. I think it would make perfect sense for you to keep this dog. I were re I were really hoping you'd say that. He is a very good boy. He is. She strokes him. If you find out anything more about him, or he does anything else strange, do let me know and see if we can unpick this mystery. I will. Do you have any ideas about how I might find out more about him? Well. If he belongs to Lionheart, and he is alive, and is somehow following you, which seems incredibly unlikely, then he will eventually reveal himself to you. But like I said, it could be that this dog has just survived after his master has perished. In which case, he is just a dog with some extra power. Don't let him die. That's the plan. That's certainly the plan. But I shall leave you with your dog for now, and I shall see you tomorrow. Thank you. Thanks, Serafina. She laughs and then leaves. Augustus, uh, you guys set up camp in the evening. And there is a roaring campfire and you get to know the gnomes a little bit more. And they tell you the stories of Slate Home and what happened on the solstice and the execution of Mayor Doxy Abelman. 
And how did that take place, good gnomes? Was it done publicly? Yes, she was supposed to be awarding um, a, a key to the city to Greta Hammerstein, um, but Greta never showed up. Instead, it was those Tam Race thugs, and they told the people that the Empire needed them to do what they did best, and then they pulled her out, and they chopped her head off right in front of her family. I'm very sorry to hear it. I somewhat suspect young Greta may have had a part in all that. Hmm, we heard rumours about that as well. Yes, well, we saw her with Tiram Tamrace on our way here. They were making off from the city. Oh, that Tiram Tamrace, I tell you, the whole foundation, they've been gearing the city up towards mining procedure. That Leith, who is Tiram's brother, absolutely feckless individual, he's been passing a series of executive laws which forced everyone to pivot in their work for the same goal. And that goal seems to be mining Grod Sankir. Fascinating. Mining for what? I'd imagine it'll be some kind of materials needed for war. The newspapers are full of mentions of war with Crimson Reach. I see. And do we know anything of the mining? Are they making tunnels? Do we... Is the, is the purpose not discussed? We let we fled the city before they started properly. We could see the writing was on the wall, it was just a case of getting out before we were forced down into the mountain holes. Very wise. And are you making efforts to bring more of your fellows to sanctuary? Absolutely. There's a there's a number of people who are working for the order who have remained in the city. It's a man who works in a shop by the name of Hardy, and he has formed the main contact for us there in order to help get people out. But it's not easy. They've kind of locked down the city as best they can. So smuggling people out has to be done piecemeal. Fine fellow is Hardy. And who leads the order? Is it the mysterious Captain Plex? The Dread Pirate Plex has been very good at leading the men and he has been certainly evacuating a number of people, myself included. But the action took him to River City and Serafina decided it was better to strike at the food supplies of the Empire than it was to rescue the people of Slate Home. That can be done much more subtly than having an airship flying in and airlifting people out. Yes, I see. It does sound like they have time, even if the intervening time will be somewhat miserable for them. Well, the gnomes of Slate Home are tough. I'm sure. I can see. He gives you a nod. And you can tell after years of moving in social circles that the, the gnomes who you've been chatting to are actually growing to like you. You know when you're being when you're liked. And these people like you. Don't you know when I'm disliked? <laughs> Do you? <laughs> <laughs> can I have another D20 roll, please? Another four. I am on fire tonight. Your evening's rest is disturbed by strange sounds. It sounds like in the distance there are unusual animalistic howls and roars. They don't appear to be getting closer, however. Okay. Is there any way I can check to see what these might be? I'm not, I don't suppose Augustus is much of a woodsman, to be honest. Give me a survival check. Thirteen. You don't recognise these creatures, which leads you to think that they must be something rather exotic or unusual. Certainly not something that you would associate with the lands that you're in. Uh, despite the sounds, however, nothing ever moves closer towards you. you. Keep your ears peeled, if you can do that. And yeah, and eventually you drift off to sleep. Travelling alone, with no one else holding you back, Vanda, you are able to make your way quickly to the south, to the village of Rutal. You are not interrupted anywhere along the way by any bandits or creatures or anything like that. And you pull into the, the village itself, which is, it's a beautiful little village. Uh, a few small huts with a central inn in the middle called The Flask. And you head towards what looks like from the outside a blacksmith's hut but the door is open. I was really afraid on rolling a three that I would not make it, but that's wonderful news. So Vanda pulls the handbrake outside of the blacksmith's hut and again, with a similar level of difficulty, manages to get off the stagecoach and begins shambling to the door. I knock three times. Come in. Vanda opens the door and shambles into the blacksmith's forge. And inside, you see a shop that is filled with magical items, weapons. There's a forge, a bellows. And there is a man in his 
mid-60s with greying hair and a bald head who is currently smashing a knife with a blacksmith's hammer. You recognise him as someone you have met during the war years. This is Colton Shea. This is lovely. He says he's not looking around, but he is looking around. The magical eye whirring in all directions. But from the outsider's perspective, Vander appears to be still. Welcome, uh, stranger. Uh, this is my blacksmith hutter. How can I help you today? You've done very well for yourself, Colton, Vander says, stepping closer to the counter. The old man looks up for a moment and stares at you. I'm sorry. Do we know one another? Yes, I suppose it has been some time, Vander says, considering. Thirteen years by my reckoning. And yes, I have undergone some changes since we've last met. Nevertheless, it is a pleasure to see you again. No recollection, he says, tilting his head to one side. Colton stares at you for a moment. Oh my gods, is it the blade itself? Yes, and Vander smiles. What in the five hells has happened to you? More than I would like, to be frank. But yes, you are correct. It's good to know that, even in my current state, those who knew me well can still recognize me underneath all this experience. Vanda smiles again. I thought you were dead. How did you survive the war? In truth, I would argue that that was my last life. I was, as you know, captured and subjected to some quite innovative techniques which left me in my current state. Little more than bones and ambition now, I'm afraid. But nevertheless, I remain alive. It is good to see you. Age does terrible things to a body. Torture, more so it would seem. That is true enough, though age also brings good things too, I see. You've done rather well for yourself. This is a well-made forge. And, if I may say, you were quite the talent when we last met. So, one would assume your talents have only grown. Would I be correct? Well, yes, of course. I've spent all the years since I last saw you trying to perfect my craft, trying to understand the things that Avros taught me. What brings you to this place? How did you know I was here? Ah, well... It's always good to keep track of old comrades. I find it a most useful pastime. Tracking you down, of course, was no great difficulty. You've not changed a great deal, even after so much time. Speaking of your skills, though, I do have a test of sorts. And with that, Vanda produces the flintlock and places it on the table between them. Do you remember the day I picked up this artifact. Oh, I could scarcely forget. And he pulls a small monocle out of his pocket and puts it in his eye and begins to study the gun. This, this is a flintlock. This is the one of a kind. This is an Avros original. I still remember the day you took it from that captain. What's his name? His name is not important. Rather, the flintlock itself is the reason I have visited on you again. You see, it has lost some of its rather more valuable properties over the years. I confess I do not have the skill to return them, but I thought you may. Well, as you know, this is not simply a wondrous item of creation. One must give part of oneself to it in order to unleash its full potential. It was constructed by Avros for a forgotten nobleman decades ago. I mean, its very construction is intended to be less powerful in the hands of anyone other than its original owner. That being said, I have of course spent many years trying to understand its fine details. Difficult without the piece in my possession. But I have been working on plans to upgrade it. It is indeed good news. 
I agree few possessed the intellect of Avaros, and certainly I have never come across an artifact quite as alluring as this since that very fortunate day. The captain crossed our paths, and while I have already given away rather more parts of my body than I would care to, I suppose a small investment would be worth the valuable artifact working as it once did. Well, normally I wouldn't sell these plans to anyone, never mind hand them over willingly, but to the possessor of the weapon itself. That's a different matter, and a serendipitous one. I should add, of course, that I have little coin, and, um, shall we say on rather harder times than I would like, I was hoping that you might consider this upgrade for an old friend. I'll be honest with you, even with my years of planning, I'm not sure I would trust myself with the upgrade of a weapon of this magnitude. Writing blueprints is one thing, but actually performing the act is something entirely different. I see, says Vanda, considering. Then perhaps I could have the blueprints, he says, re-intensifying his gaze. I would happily hand the blueprints over to you, and if times are tough for you, well, times are tough for everyone since the Empire took over. Brutal is not the peaceful reserve it once was. A bandit gang has entered the town. They call themselves the Chain. They've taken control of the population, installed themselves as sheriffs, and demand their own tithes in the form of protection. They don't seem to mention that the protection is from them themselves. If you truly are the blade itself, perhaps you could rid the place of that scum, and I would happily reimburse you with these blueprints as thanks from an old friend. How oh, terrible, Vanda says, in something short of surprise. Bandits and bullying are something I generally disdain. But as a friend to you, I would of course consider assisting you a little, a nudge here maybe. A quiet word there, and perhaps these bandits can be persuaded to bandit elsewhere. A good deal. Excellent. And Vanda reaches out one gnarled hand. And Colton shakes it. For me to keep my side of the bargain, of course, I would benefit from knowing where to find these bandits. Well, it's midday, so they'll likely be at the flask just across the road. Ah, ridding you of a problem whilst also getting a drink. I'll be back in, shall we say, ten minutes. I look forward to seeing you then, Blade itself. A pleasure. And Vanda shambles towards the door. Augustus, you set off for another day's travel. This day's travel is much faster. Obviously, the cart, brain, yourself and the gnomes are now growing accustomed to traveling in this strange land where it's too quiet for comfort. But wanting to make good pace, you open it up slightly uh, and travel a vast distance over the course of eight hours or so. As you get closer in the direction of the citadel, still days away from where you think it might be. The weather finally changes and it begins to rain quite heavily. The environment you're in also changes. It's kind of the plains are gone and now it's quite hilly and almost a little bit mountainous in parts. It, the best way to describe it is if a gigantic hammer has come down and smashed the ground and caused it to become uneven and craggy. Um, but you're still able to move quickly despite all of these obstacles in your way. Um, the persistent crashing rain does soak you all though because you were in a cart and not stagecoach um, as your travel draws to a close the rain finally lets up and you see in the distance to the east a crackling fire inside a dark cave someone has made camp nearby okay well i alert my traveling buddies to this fire if they haven't seen it what do you think we should do i feel we must investigate we proceed cautiously but 
I'd like to see who set this fire. That is a good plan. Thrain directs the cart towards the cave mouth, and moments later you can see the fire crackling away quite clearly. Next to it is the remains of a small animal, maybe a small rodent that's been picked clean. And sat quietly next to the fire is a human wearing loose-fitting dark robes, and his face is wrapped in bandages, as far as you can see. Uh, well met, friend. Why do we share your fire? He turns to look at you, and you see he has pale blue eyes, which study you carefully. Well met, travellers. Come, sit by the fire. Okay. Augustus does that. Uh, he casts a glance back, kind of hoping the gnomes will, maybe one or two might hang back. Probably should have said that in advance, but, you know, thinking we shouldn't all just walk into the cave and turn our backs in case there's anyone else. Unfortunately, it, it is too late to do that, so unless you want to tell them directly. Uh, well, as we walk in, then Augustus say, perhaps someone ought to tend the horse. The gnomes look at one another and then back at you and Pip sighs deeply and steps back out into the kind of bad weather to stand by the cart. Augustus does not look like he feels bad about what just happened. Might we offer you some food? Says Augustus, offering out a ration as he sits down at the fire. Or perhaps a drink? Food would be good. Okay. Augustus hands over whatever sort of food ration he has to spare. Some, maybe some bread and meat or something. And the man in the robes with the bandages across his face now you're closer even by the firelight you can see that underneath the bandages is heavily scarred skin now he's obviously had some damage to his face in the past and he's wrapped it up uh, but the bandages look dirty and quite old but they haven't been changed for weeks what brings you out into this strange land my friend i am traveling to the citadel i see for what purpose it's a mysterious place from what we hear it is indeed the Citadel is my destination. I wish to see what has happened to it. You visited before its downfall. I did. I am from Roanoke. I see. And what do you remember of its former splendor? My The, the stories of it are really wonderful. My memory is hazy. The years have not been kind to me. But I feel I must go back and see what they have done to it. And what role did you play in the citadel or in roanoke when you lived here you were a child no an adult a farmer perhaps things are so confusing in my head i see and is that always the case for you since your injuries or is your memory affected as you return to this land no it has been weeks i sustained these injuries somehow i can't remember were you alone when you came into Roanoke? Yes, I have been alone. And as he talks, you notice he has a kind of gravelly, almost raspy sound, as if he's not used to talking. And yet you remain determined to push on to the, to the Citadel. People say you will find what you are looking for in the Citadel. I don't know what I am looking for, but I feel it may be there. I see. Well, we would like to aid you if we can. Although, I do not think our journey on this occasion will take us as far as the Citadel. Perhaps we might journey together a little way. Any help would be appreciated. So Augustus glances at Thrain to see if he has a strong view on picking up this lunatic on our adventure. Thrain seems happy to follow your lead on it. Uh, can we do anything else to help with your injuries? Are you a healer of some kind? A barber surgeon? No barber surgeon, but I have a, a little medical training. Any medical help would be appreciated. So I'm going to... Lay on hands, see what I can do to ease his wounds. Okay, and how many hit points would you like to give him? I will give him five hit points. Okay, you lay your hands on him, and in the darkness of the cave you see kind of a, a glowing light almost appear on the on the outline of your hands as you place it on his chest. And he has been relatively unmoving since you arrived, but you see him sit up a bit straighter and kind of breathe a bit deeper. Thank you. I feel better. Good. Well, perhaps you can get some rest on the cart as we continue our northward journey. You plan to sleep? Uh, yes, we do plan to sleep. We might make a, our camp a little way off. We're not, we're not used to sleeping in caves, but we could join forces with you again in the morning. This is acceptable to me. Uh, what's your name, friend? My name is Corrith. Friend. I'm Augustus Sino. I hail from Donothlia, across the sea. I do not know Donothlia. It's a former friend of Roanoke. Give me a perception check, please. Four. 
Again with the fours. And one last question, Corrith, if you'll permit me. Where have you been in the intervening years since you were first driven from Roanoke? I do not remember. Have you ever seen a plate dropped and shattered? I've seen plates dropped. That is how my mind feels. I remember seeing the citadel from distance, and then I awoken, battered and broken. Very well. Well, we wish you a peaceful night's rest. And Augustus withdraws without telling the guy that years have passed since the fall of the Citadel. Feels like too much for this guy. <clears throat> Augustus, you, Thrain, and the gnomes set up camp away from the cave and settle down for a night's sleep. Unlike other nights, there are no strange sounds to keep you awake. And yet, you drift into an uneasy slumber. And we'll end it there. The humans of Dice Company would like to thank the following sweethearts for their support. Mickey Arnold, Happy Daddy Scotty, Tika SJ Fionix, Richard Ungamus, Rabbi Camel, Team Vander, Harris Pakar, Path Pursuit, Julia Zeno, Shovels, Mama Strange, Queenie, Liz Beckett, Axel Runholm, Shay Benton, and Chris from North London. Thanks for listening, everyone. Now over to our town crier, Alex, for an update from the Dice Company universe. Uh, listeners of a sensitive disposition would, may wish to turn off now. I'll see you later. We tweeted, In our Candela Obscura murder mystery, we discover the victim folded pages of the corners while reading books. <gasps> Horrified by this, Dave suggests he, quote, got what he deserved. Uh, what's your view on folding book pages? Uh, a, fine. B, unforgivable. On Twitter, 62% of people voted unforgivable. Uh, and Space Hamster said, if it's your book, do what you like. If it's, me if it's my book, I'll fold your corners. <laughs> <laughs> In a similar vein, Unseen D4 said, you own books? If it's a soft cover, do whatever. They're meant to be cheap and disposable. Your own hardcover, you're clearly stupid. Buy soft covered and then abuse your books. My books, I'll fucking fold you. <laughs> Uh, Chris Williams said, Back in university, I had a paperback copy of the first chronicles of Thomas Covenant. I'd read it from cover to cover and kept it in a pretty much pristine condition. A friend, well, a household of friends, asked to borrow it, borrow it and I agreed. Months later, it comes back to me still looking pristine. Years later, one of the household admits that between the household, they pretty much read it to destruction, couldn't face giving it back to me in that sort of condition, so bought a brand new copy uh, and knew I wouldn't notice. Anyway, we're married now. Oh, that's very cool. <laughs> nice. Aww. I'm, I'm going to add my two pence in and say that folding the corners of books is fine. As long as you're seeking a, you know, quick death. Have you ever <laughs> borrowed a book yeah. from someone who says, sure, you can borrow the book, but you have to do that thing where you hold it semi-closed whilst reading it? Okay, firstly, you don't ever lend or borrow books. You give them as gifts. And if you're not willing to give them as gifts, then people should just go and get their own fucking books. Books should never be lent people are not libraries okay yeah, I, I, strongest I, evidence ever that he works for big book yeah <laughs> you should all buy that leads to, exactly everyone needs <laughs> their own copy of the book whatever book i don't know i can get behind this in the sense that i've lent out quite a few books in my time and haven't received many of them back ever yeah <laughs> i have um, i have one book in my house which i borrowed off someone and didn't return and it's been about 10 years and it still bothers me Oh. I know exactly who I borrowed it from and I uh, still feel bad about it. I'll have yeah. it back if you want. Which book? Uh, it's a copy of Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Ah, It's the Kama Sutra and you borrowed it from your mum. <laughs> Look on Tom's face there. Uh, I, I, I have heard the title. That's as far as I'm willing to go. I think I've still got a copy of I Am A Strange Loop from Rob that I borrowed at uni. Uh, so that would be nearly 20 years ago. You people are terrible. Also on the subject of folding book pages aria underground on blue sky said i would never i would simply tear out the previous page and use it as a bookmark like it <laughs> like it crown titmouse replied to that just by saying monster <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
Paul, Paul Box on Blue Sky said, I have the original three paperback set of The Adventures of Han Solo by Brian Daly that my dad got me as a kid. The covers are a little dinged, but the spine hasn't creased and there's a folded page and there's not a folded page corner to be found. That's the answer. The victim found out. Uh, so <laughs> the victim being Ernest Wainwright, who apparently dog-eared his pages. Uh, Justin on Blue Sky said, I go to stores and libraries and just fold whole pages right in half on random books. Oh, that's too far for me. Yeah, that's what, yeah, even yeah, even for me. So when we tweeted about our Candela Obscura, the Squire replied, "The description of the binding paper contract did put me in mind of apples, T's and C's." <laughs> <laughs> oh, there was some terms condition thing years ago where they put at the back, like at the end of the thing, if you scroll down, uh, that you promise to uh, um, see to them your firstborn soul. <laughs> <laughs> confident in the uh, knowledge that no one would read it. <laughs> yeah, I'm living with the consequences of that one. <laughs> On Twitter, we asked people about their epic fails, and Scowl, your dagger-happy friend, said, I was a very, very new player and hadn't encountered the concept of the BBEG monologuing. BBEG, big, bad, evil, evil guy. guy. Yeah. Evil guy, monologuing, and then running off. So when Strad showed up the first time, I fireballed him, fireballed him and he proceeded to tpk us yeah he would do that so just for your reference al strad von sarovich i think his name is is like a legendary vampire lord who in ravenloft oh no please don't say you got it has his own book uh... the curse of strad there he is so do, do not attempt to fireball this man if you see him call the police and retreat to a safe distance john fort on epic fail said a player in a traveller game I was running thought the stars thought stars and gas giants were the same thing and insisted on piloting the ship into the sun to refuel it. <laughs> Andy W on Blue Sky said, Not mine, but my late cousin tipping over oil pots, thinking erroneously that the room he was in sloped down into the room where the rest of the party were battling an Aztec vampire who possessed an axe that could cast burning hands. The DM gave him a couple of chances before the vamp used the axe's ability to ignite the oil. There was a 10% chance the rest of the containers would go up. A roll of one obliterated the room and his mage. <laughs> oh. uh, but it gets better. The funniest part was when, in a fit of rage, he threw his character sheet away and it spun around the table and landed straight back in front of him the right way up. I thought my mate Mark was going to choke to death. He was laughing so hard. <laughs> I love that. The idea of the hissy fit. Throw your paper up in the air. It like spins around and just sits back down in front of you. <laughs> uh, that's it from the social media stuff. Please keep sending us your amazing thoughts because we need good content. Or do you want me to say more? No, nope, that's Lots fine. more. <laughs> oh, that's all the description he needs. That's all we need. I feel like that's a trap. Uh, Hello. Hello, I play. Uh, yeah, bzz, <laughs> Way! <laughs> <laughs> Someone else fucked up! Alright. On the podcast. <laughs> and the other one, I suppose. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Me hitting on a Dane. No, 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 no. <laughs> Unless it's Helen Mirren, um, who I once stood up. But that's another story. Lore. Thanks for listening. Please consider supporting Dice Company on Patreon or on Apple Podcasts, where for the price of a cup of coffee, you get access to a whole other show, Extra Rules, where the gang look back over previous chapters of the Dice Company story. Don't forget, you can find us on our socials at Dice Company on Blue Sky, at Dice Company Pod on X, and at Dice Company Podcast everywhere else. If you enjoyed this chapter, please like and subscribe, and don't forget to recommend us to your friends. If you didn't like it, recommend us to your enemies. And we'll see you next time on Dice Company. <laughs>